Welcome to the recording of the live session for the Python Programming for Linguists workshop. This is a shortened and edited recording of that live session. And I've also added a couple of slides detailing some background information. So whenever there is a slide, just briefly pause the video, have a look, and this will give you some background information on what you're about to see and also maybe some technical background on the things that we are doing. I hope you're enjoying this recording and keep in mind this was a live session and I've cut out a few parts and I've shortened it a little bit just to make it a bit more convenient for those such as yourself who watch this after the fact. Welcome to the live session for the Python programming for linguists workshop and in this live session which has an indefinite length so um I'll, I'll do some exercises and you're free to ask all the questions that you want to ask. And depending on that, we'll see how long it takes, but feel free to drop in, drop out however you want. I'll record this session and so it will be available after the fact anyway. So what are we going to do today? We are going to go into the exercises. I think I have them open already. Yeah. So we are going to solve together exercises 8 to 16. It's a lot of stuff to do, but I think we'll cover a couple interesting things there. These are all linguistics or corpus linguistics exercises. And well, let's see how we do. I decided to do all of this in a fresh notebook. So we're going to build up this notebook together. And well, there is a certain risk attached to that uh, because I, I'm not basically using pre-prepared code here, but we're going to live code this, which is hopefully a little bit more fun. And also um, this will help with getting into the thought process of all of that. So let's start again, feel free. I will have the chat open on a second screen here so I can see. Um, so if there's any questions, just let me know. All right, so before we go into the exercises, we are going to do some prep work here. So I'm assuming that most of you either have some basic experience or that you worked to at least a little bit of the material that I provided. And some of the stuff we are doing today is probably a little bit too advanced or at least somewhat advanced but they are with me and then if there's anything that that you are completely confused about you can always go back to the material later and have a look at that all right before we do anything we will first get the repository so all of the data into our environment and we are going to do this using git um and i'm going to add this well magic thing here uh, capture and that basically just means that this cell, so this cell here, will from now on not um, have any output. So whatever I do here is, is without output. And I'm then going to git clone, and then I'm just going to copy paste a repository here from the other screen. I'm just going to git clone the repository so that we have all the data from that repository. And if I say repository, I mean this GitHub repository here available to us. So all the data that's here is now available to us. And we can check this out here in this file view. Google Collab has this nice little file view. So the files are all there. Beautiful. Okay. Now a second step before we go into the exercises is that we need to learn two new things in terms of Python, two things that have not been covered yet. And um, it's not necessary to fully understand them. But uh, since we'll be using them in the exercises, it's good to have a basic idea. The first thing is list comprehensions. So let's assume uh, that we have a list of uh, numbers, something like that, for example. And now what we want to do is we want, for example, to create a new list from that, but we want each number to be multiplied by 10. So what we could do is we could create a for loop. So we could say for number in numbers. And then, well, we need a new list, of course. So n times 10, for example, and we create an empty list. So just now an empty list. And now for a number in numbers, so we are looping through this list here. We are going to append or add that number, but times 10. So append, and then we take the number times 10. And if we run this, 
Well, there's no output, of course, so I, I'm going to output this n times 10. We now have a new list containing 10, 20, 30, 1, 2, 3 times 10. Perfect. There is a shorthand way of doing this, and that is a list comprehension. And uh, I'm, I'm going to write it out, and then we'll have a look at it. So you can also just write the following n times 10 for n in numbers. If I run this, it's exactly the same thing. So we can basically create lists that contain of these loops. And this is, um, this is called a list comprehension, like that. Um, and so we can use these as shorthands if we, do, if we want to do lists, quickly do lists. Um, this is quite useful, and it is particularly useful if we are working with so-called lists of lists. So let's say we have a list of lists. And this is now probably already fairly complicated, but you've seen that in the pizza example, hopefully. So we have a list of lists, and in that list we have three items. So let's say 1a and 2b, for example, and 3c. Okay. Um, so let's print this for a second. And I don't need to write print in here because these cells just work based like that. So now we have this list of lists with three items. Now let's say we want to create a new list again from this, but we only want the, for example, the first element here, so the a, b, and c. So what we can do now is we can again write a list comprehension, and now we do the following. So um, we do n, and then we now go with 1 for n in lol. <laughs> if I run this, we get a, b, c. But why? OK, so what we are doing. So internally, what happens is the following. So we, are, we have now a shorthand for this. So for n in LOL. And now each element of LOL is again a list, right? So each element in LOL is one of these, right? So for example, 2 comma b. And now for each of these, we are taking basically the, so we could also print this. We are taking the zeroth, or in that case, the first element. Get rid of that. And if we run this, we print a, b, c. And now we can do all of that in one list comprehension, and that gives us that. And this is how these list comprehensions work. This is exactly the same thing than a for loop, but it's a shorthand version. OK, so far so good. Don't uh, think too much about this. It's just a useful little thing that we are going to use. Let's go on. We also will need pandas. And pandas is a library. And that library is very useful because it allows us to create tables. And this is a data analysis and data manipulation tool that's used as a de facto standard in data science. And it'll also, and that's kind of the heritage of this thing, it will allow us to do all the things that one would do, for example, in R. So the statistical programming language R. If you're familiar with that, for example, or with some other statistical things like statistical toolkits like Stata or uh, SPS or something like that, SPSS, uh, then this will look familiar. So what we're going to do is we're going to import pandas, and now we are going to use SPD, and this is just changing the name. So SPD just basically renames this to a shorthand, and this is very commonly used with pandas. So now we have pandas available, and now let me show what this does. So in pandas, the main idea is that we have so-called data frames. And data frames are tables, are tables that have some very cool features attached to them. And uh, I'll show you how this works. I'm just going to copy paste some data from here. Um, I have this magic, magic other document here. So we are going to do this. And well, first, we have to create a data frame. So we will call the data frame data frame. And df is a pd data frame, and this creates an empty data frame, an empty table, so to speak. And now we are adding this data here. And I'll show you what the data frame looks like, and then it will make sense. So we now created this table here, or this data frame. And this data frame has three columns, and each column here is indicated as one list. So each column is one list. And this is fictional data, so let's assume that we have um, four documents, and then for each of these documents we have uh, two more pieces of data. We have a token count and we have a sentiment count. And for the fourth document or the third document, depending on how you want to count, we are missing the sentiment data. And now we have this table available to us, and that is 
uh, very cool. If we didn't want to do this manually, and that's also a powerful feature in pandas, we could have also done this. So we could have done um, df is pandas load. Ah, it's not load, it's read. It's read. We can do read, and then we can do um, various things. So we can read, for example, from Excel files um, or from uh, HTML files, JSON files, and so on. We want to read from CSV, and we're now going to read some dummy data. So in here, you can just put a path, and within the repository here, we have in data, um, I've put some test data, the pandas demo CSV. And I'm just going to show you this. And this is exactly the same data that we've just created manually. So I'll copy paste that path in here. So this is Python programming for linguists, blah, 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 panda uh, demo CSV. Let's call this data frame two. Now we have this data available to us. So we can use pandas also to read in external data. And this is, this is rather neat to have. OK, so now we have tables. That's cool. Um, let's uh, work a little bit with this, and then we're going into the actual linguistic stuff. What we can do is, so let's work with the initial um, data frame, uh, which is the same data anyway. What we first can do is we can set an index. So as you can see in this table, uh, we have this index here, 0, 1, 2, 3. Maybe we want the document to be that index. So we want to maybe shift that to the left here. So what we can do is we can do data frame, set index, and then we can just give it the name of the column. It's fairly straightforward. And if we do this, and then we basically took this document column, which was initially here, and we now we have this as our index. OK, cool. So now we have this table that looks like this. So a table with tokens and sentiment. OK, you still might now wonder, OK, OK, so it's a table. Cool. Um, well, anyway, it's a table. That's at least something that we are familiar with. The first thing we can do is we can look at individual um, columns here. So let's say we want to look at the tokens, then we can just do df and then within these brackets tokens, and then we'll get all of the all of our token counts. And now the interesting bit starts because we can take the same thing and now we can also ask Python or pandas in that right, regard for some statistics. So let's say we want to have the mean of that, then we can just call this mean method. And then we'll get the mean. That's pretty cool. We can also do, for example, the median or some and the standard deviation and some other statistics. And if we want all of these descriptive statistics, we can call one very basic command, and that command is describe. Please, pandas, describe this data to me. And then we will get the count, the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, and the quartiles for that particular set of data. We can, of course, do the same thing for sentiment. And then we get the same results here. And this is, of course, very cool if you're doing statistics because then you have all of that on hand. Now, what we can also do is we can select data. So if you want to say we want, for example, only the documents with a token count that's beyond something, then we can do the following. It looks a bit strange, but uh, what we can do is we can basically say we want in our data frame all the data that follows this filter or this rule, so to speak. So the rule will be data frame tokens is larger than, for example, 2000. And then we'll only get documents two and three, which are above 2000. And this way we can select data, which is, again, pretty neat that we are able to do this. Now, one final trick, as you can see, the uh, data for a sentiment is not there. And there's an autom automated function to fill in missing data. So what we can do is we can do df. And now the command is fill, na, fill not available. And now we can tell it what we want to use to fill this. And so what we do is, for this example, we want to use the mean. So we take as a value the mean of that data frame. And then we run this. And now instead of not available, we have the mean for this missing piece of data. And whether that's a clever choice is dependent on your research question or what you want to do. But it's fairly clever. You could also do, if you don't want to use the mean, we could also just use a number. So we could give it, for example, a one, and then we'll fill this up with one. Although this is probably even more pointless than using the mean. Bottom line, keep in mind, we have these data frames, and data frames are tables, but it's tables 
that have some very nice properties that we can use to do some computation, some statistics, and some selection on them. And we'll use them later in more detail. All right, now that we have this out of the way, let's go into these exercises. And by the way, the only thing that's in this document right now are headlines so that I know uh, where we are at. Okay, the first thing we'll do is we'll create a little bit of code here for our environment. And the first thing we're going to do is we are going to download or to install two more libraries. And I've just copy pasted this in. And the two libraries we're going to install is text directory, which you already possibly at least saw in one of the videos. And we're also going to install something that's called just text or just text, which we're going to use later. So we're going to run this and pip is just a tool with which you can install Python libraries into your Python environment. So right now we are running a Python environment on a Google server and we're using pip to install Python packages into that environment. And the next thing we're going to do is we are going to create some import statements here, and this will grow over time, but we're already going to import regular expressions because that's very useful. And we're also going to import statistics because that's also a very neat thing and maybe also math. Um, and th there will be more, uh, more when we go, when we go forward. Okay. The third thing we need to just set up our environment is to download some more data. So we already git cloned our data. And now we are going to run two scripts and you don't need to think about uh, what's going on behind the scenes. If you want to figure it out, have a look at the files on your own, but basically we're running these two scripts and what these two scripts will do is they will download. Um, oops, I should have put, I should have put one of these capture statements before. That these will just will download two corpora from the internet, unpack them so that we have them available to us in our environment later. So this probably already happened. And now we have this new folder here called corpora and in that new folder corpora. We now have a coca sampler and we also have the hum 19 UK, the full corpus so that we have some data to play with. Okay. Great. So that's that for setting up. And now we can go into the actual exercise. So this was now all set up. So basically, and this is pretty common that you do this at the beginning of like, uh, for example, a project, if you're building uh, one of these notebooks for, let's say a research project, that you have some, some step where you download what you need, then you import the stuff you need, and then you maybe also have some scripts to download some data or something like that. Okay. Let's now go into the exercises. Okay. Um, the first exercise we are going to look at is the exercise eight concordance term. And I'll just have that open so that we can basically look at what we have to do. So exercise eight, write a basic concordance term that can generate concordances based on a given file and a given search term. And then we also built a quick, uh, concordance term. So, okay. What is, what is, what is concordancing? Um, and what is a quick concordance term? So let's have a brief look at that. So you've probably seen that. So a quick concordance or essentially is we have some search word in the middle and then we have some um, words to the side. And so this is our search term basically. And then this is a quick concordance. So there's some text here and then this is our E word. And this is the context here. And this is kind of what these, what these look like at least um, in a quick view. So this is what's meant by uh, by quick keywords and context. Okay. So how do we build these? We are going to build two versions. So we are going to build basically a, a very basic version. And then we're also going to build an actual quick, um, quick concordance. And this is not as hard as it, as it sounds. So we need some test data to do that. And we are going to use the Wikipedia data that, um, is in the repository to do that. And I'm going to now use text directory to use that. So we'll have to import that here so that we have access to it. So import text directory. Great. Now we have that and now we can run this and I've copy pasted this. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create Wikipedia and this is a text directory object and we are reading in 
the Wikipedia text files using text directory. So I'm going to run this. Now we have this available. And now what we can do is we can use get text, for example, get text zero to access these texts. And then we just have, so this is just a string essentially. Okay, so now let's think about building a concordancer. Okay, so let's build a very basic concordancer first. So let's pick one document, let's say Cologne, that's the first document here. And that is literally just, just that. But let's put this into a variable so that we have that. And now one approach to do this would be to just simply search for the word that we are looking for. So let's say that our search term is city. What we can do is we can use regular expressions to search for that in our document. And I've already opened this up here. The regular expression that we could use is this, and it looks fairly complicated, but let's go through this regular expression step by step. So this is the same text. So the idea is we are looking for city. So that's our search term. But of course we need context to the left and to the right, because we are interested in not just the search term, but we're interested in what's left to the search term and also what's right to the search term. And since we don't have a concept of words or tokens right now, but only characters, we'll use character features here. So this is an or feature in regular expressions. So we can get, let's copy this, and we'll build this up step by step. If we don't have that, well, let's, let's first just do city. So if we just have city, we'll find only, only city, right? And that doesn't really do much for us. So we, we want to add a little bit of context here. So let's say we also want characters. So we take all characters, including spaces, everything. And let's say we take everything between zero and 25 here. Okay, cool. So this will give us everything to the left of city, right? That's good. So now we already have, we have half concordance and we'll also add a word boundary here. So backslash B is word boundary so that we have this a space. This is usually a space. And now we need to do the same thing, but for the other side. So we are going to do a dot again for all characters, zero to 25. And now we get 25 characters to the right of that. Now that is great. However, and this is now a little bit tricky, there could be a situation in which city is the first word basically, and there is nothing left to city. And then we wouldn't find that. And that's why we do an or here. And we then do basically the same thing, city, but then only to the right. So in cases where city is actually the first word where there is no left context, we do an or so that we also match that. And that's a regular expression that we're going to use. If you are not firm with regular expressions, which you probably not, this might is a little bit confusing. Have a look at it in your own time, in your own speed. Bottom line is this now allows us to find things that have city in the middle and then there's between zero and 25 characters to the right or to the left. And now let's build this in Python. That's actually relatively easy. So we are going to do a regular expression and we're going to build to pre-build this. And the regular expression is that, and that's exactly what you just saw. And we're also adding this additional attribute here, um, ignore case, because we don't want to have case. We don't want to have this case sensitive. Okay, and now we are getting our concordances. So concordances equals regular expressions, find all, we want all of them. The pattern is regex, so this above here, and the text is cologne. And now let's print these. And now we have a concordancer. Well, sort of, sort of concordancer. It's definitely not pretty, but it's all the instances of city in our corpus. And then of course we could replace this. So let's say um, we wanna do Germany instead. A very tedious way of doing a concordancer. Um, and conk is definitely easier to use, but it works. So that's good. But of course, let's build a slightly better version of that. And we're going to use this as, an, as a way of also introducing tokenization. So the idea is 
we still have that text and we have no concept of tokens. We're just in character world. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to tokenize this text. And this will then give us a list where that's the idea that we have. So we want a list where each word is one element of the list, right? So it looks something like this. So these are then lists. So each instance of, uh, for example, city as a keyword is one list. And then in that list, we have all of the tokens for that finding. Okay, so how do we build that? That's slightly more tricky than what we just did, but we've already seen the building blocks of that. The first thing we need to build is a concordant, uh, sorry, is a tokenizer. So we need to be able to tokenize things. And of course, um, we'll need that more often. So we are going to build a function that allows us to tokenize things. And this is going to be a very, very, very basic tokenizer. The most basic tokenizer um, we probably can build. So let's define a function called tokenizer. And this function will take in a text. And that's basically it. And then we are going to return, it's going to be very basic. A regular expression, find all, or now we are going to use backslash w plus for words. And this kind of, this basically finds words. This is a very, very basic way of implementing a tokenizer, but at least for English um, and related languages, it works fine. I wouldn't recommend using this um, in production, so to speak but it works fine. So we now have a tokenizer. Let's test it. Tokenizer, uh, let's say hello world and run this and we get a list hello world. Awesome, we now have a tokenizer. That's the first step. Okay, now that we can tokenize our corpus, what we're going to do is, so let's first create a variable called search word um, so that this is a little bit more um, a little bit better. And then we also now define a, a, um, a window or a span, and let's say the span is four. And now we are going to build a fairly complicated loop. I'm going to write it out and then we're going through it step by step. So what we're going to do is, so we are going to um, loop over our corpus, but we're not going to loop over words because that wouldn't really help us because we need indices. So the first step is we are going to tokenize our corpus. I've forgotten that. So tokenizer, and then we add our, oops, uh, we add cologne here. So we have a tokenized version of cologne. Awesome. So corpus, or let's, uh, let's be more precise here. Let's say cologne tokenized. Okay. For ID in range, and range is just a number, and now the range should be the length of our text. And now, so what we're effectively doing now is we're looping over all of the words in that tokenized text. And now we're looking for our search term. So if purpose ID is our search word, then, so if we find that, we want to create a new instance, basically, um, for search results. And we're going to do this by adding to quick. So we're creating quick, and we're basically adding to this text thing. And now we're going to use slightly confusing notation. Well, actually, let me show what this does is. So there's, there's join. So let's say we have a list and that list is, let's say, uh, A, B, and C. And now if we run, if we, we can take any string, so let's say uh, we take a dash and then if we do this method, join and then a list. This will join together the list as one string. That's what join does. So it will join together all of the elements in the list. So we're going to do that. So we're going to join Parts of our, well, now I wrote corpus. Um, I renamed this cologne tokenized. Um, part of this cologne tokenized. And now we are go we're going to use slicing. So we are going to use id minus lr and then id plus lr plus one. Trust me so far, and we, we'll, you'll see how this, how this works. And then we are going to print that line. So this is essentially then one line. 
So let's run this. And of course, I made a mistake at some point. Oh, I missed the in for the in range. And oh, I used Corpus again. Clone tokenized. Okay. Now we get this output. Looks very similar to what we got above. Actually, the above one maybe looks even a little bit nicer, but that's what we have so far. But now we have tokens. That's a big difference. So now each of these words is one token, and that's actually pretty cool. So what happens here? So we understand what join is, and I can demonstrate that. So if we didn't do a um, space here, let's say we, we use that symbol, then we would join them together using a dash. Let's go back to space. And now here we are slicing. So ID is essentially just an index for the token in our text. So if our, if our text has, let's say, 10 words, then ID would be the index for that word. And we are basically looping over the whole text. And then we're using these IDs to select parts of the text. And so LR is our range for left and right. And so we are basically taking the current word and the current word is, if we're in this if construction, is our search word. And then we're taking four to the left and we're also taking um, four to the right plus one because within that span, there is also our search word. Um, again, this might be slightly confusing. So let's have a look at that. Give me a second. So what we're going to do now is we are going to differentiate between these two sides. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just copy all the code that we have here, and we're going to change this up a little. So instead of doing this print thing here, we are going to build two separate strings for left and right. So left is going to be a string, a join string, and we're basically just splitting this up. And I'm going to copy paste this to save a little bit of time. But it's essentially the same thing. And in the, in the thing I could just copy paste this from, I still have a corpus. So now, let's get rid of this. Now we essentially have a left side of the string and a right side of the string. And this is literally the same thing we built right now. And now instead of just printing this, we are going to add this to a list. So we are going to create a list, an empty list called quick. And now to that empty list, we're going to quick append. So we're adding to that list the left side. Then we're adding our search word. And then we're adding the right side. Okay, lovely. So let's do that. And well, I should give it a list, not just random stuff. Okay, and let's print this. And if we print this, we now have a slightly better view. At least we have a clear indication that this is the left context and this is the right context, and then this is what's in the middle. All right, but this is not very pretty. So we are now going to use another external library, and we need to import that. And that library is called tabulate. And tabulate allows us to print lists in a prettier way. So from tabulate, import tabulate, it's a little bit strange. So we now have tabulate available, scrolling down again, sorry for the navigation. And now we can actually use that. So we can now do tabulate, hopefully it will. Yeah, if we actually print this, it gets, it gets a lot better. And now this looks like a quick view. This looks a lot better, right? And just to prove to you that this actually works more universally, well, there is no Germany in there. Uh, Germany, this is now very, very nice. So what we've done here is first step, tokenized the text. Second step, found the word, and then based on the search word, split the context to left context to right context, added that to a list and now neatly printed that list. Okay, one more thing. It would be nice to actually sort this stuff. And to do that, we need to use the sort function or we can use the sort function. But now the issue is that 
we have three parts. So for each of these results, we have a list that contains three elements. And we actually want to sort for, for example, the context to the right here. So that would be the second element. So if we look at one individual finding, we can actually do this. So let's look into quick and let's take, for example, the zero element, right? This is zero, this is one, this is two. And we now want to sort by the second element. We want to sort lists that are in lists. And for that, we need a little bit of magic that I'm not going into too deep. Um, but we need to import specific function that allows, that allows us to do that. So we are going to import this item getter thing. And let's just assume that this is magic for now. And now what we can do is we can now sort our quick list. So we can do quick dot sort, and that's a very common thing. And now the key for this key part, we'll use the item getter and we can use the item getter with an index to sort a list of list a list of lists based on an index for the elements in that list. So now we are sorting for the second element, which is the right side in the list of lists. And if we do this, well, I should print it using tabulate and I missed a bracket here. Now that works really well. And now we sort it by the right side. So let's maybe go back to city. Okay, so this is the unsorted view for city. And now let's look at the sorted view for city. And now we can see that we have this, the right side sorted. So city, the, the, both boundaries and so on and so forth. City, cities, DS. Perfect. So we got our quick concordancer all done. That is very neat. And it was almost no work. Well, it's actually a lot of work, but um, you see, we can build this and it's actually not that tricky. The individual building blocks are just, it's a list of lists. It's exactly the same as in the pizza example, but now with tokens instead of, well, pizzas. Okay, so let's have a look at our second task here. The second task is n-grams. So we now want to generate n-grams and n-grams are, well, sequential sequences of tokens with the length of n. So, uh, so an, a, a three gram or a trigram would be, for example, in this sentence, a trigram would be write a function that produces all as a trigram, all n grams base as a trigram and so on and so forth. Or a bigram would be write a function that produces all. These are n grams. And we now want to generate these n grams using Python. And they're actually pretty useful for um, for various things. And let's do that. A side note, I'm going to add this to the document. And that's um, something you can determine if you want to, uh, why this is the case. But the number of n-grams for a given text will always be, so the number of n-grams equals the token count plus one minus the minus n um, in an n gram. This will always be the number of n grams for a given n. And that's an important piece of information that, that we need. Okay, let's take a little bit of text. So for example, this, it's a simple string. We're not going to use a file now, um, but just let's use a simple string here. I really like Python, it's pretty awesome. All right, this is a string. And now we are going to generate n grams. And we're first going to do this using an external library called NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit. And NLTK is awesome because NLTK makes our lives a lot easier. But before we do this, we need to import it, obviously. So import NLTK. And I can maybe add a little comment here that this is NLP stuff, just to, to kind of note this. Let's import that. So we now have NLTK available. And now you'll see how, how easy this is. And NLTK makes life a lot easier. So what we want to do is we want to get uh, n-grams for our text. So n-grams equals, and now we can simply use NLTK dot n-grams, very straightforward, give it a text and then the n. So let's say two and run this. 
And now if we look at the n-grams, we get a generator. So a generator is a, it basically behaves like a list. I'm not going into the exact details. It has some properties that make it useful if there's lots and lots and lots of items, because a generator will always only give you one element, but we can force this to be a list. So we can just write list and basically force it to be a list. And now we get all of the bigrams. But as you can see, it looks a bit strange, right? Well, we haven't tokenized the text yet. So we get bigrams, but based on characters. These can be useful, but um, they are not very common, at least not in corpus linguistics. So we first need to tokenize that text. So tokenized text, and we can now use our uh, nice tokenizer function that we wrote. So we tokenize our text first, then we hand our tokenized text to NLTK, and now we get all of our n-grams. And that's very neat. So these are now bigrams. We could also, uh, for example, get trigrams. I really like, really like Python, like Python it, and so on and so forth. Awesome. Easy way of generating n-grams. Now, the task actually required us to write a function. So let's do this. So let's define NLTK n-grams. This is the name that I give to this text and an n. Now we can basically use the code that we already have. Um, awesome. So we can do this. And let's do this list thing right here. And then we will return our n-grams. Now we have an n-gram function. And let's run this. NLTK n-grams. Let's give it our text here, right from above. Text. Let's run this. Oops, I forgot the n, obviously. Um, so let's say two. And oops, look, in the function, I made a mistake. I have the n here, but I didn't replace it down here. So to make this work, we need to actually put it also in there. And now if we had to do two, that should work. If I do three, that also now works. Bonus piece of information. If you have a situation like this, you can also set defaults. So if you are creating a function, you can also, in the function definition, for example, say something like n equals three. And now there's a default. So now I can run this function or call this function without giving an n. And if I do this, it will just assume the default here. I can still give it one. I can still do n equals four, and this will perfectly work perfectly fine, but I can provide defaults here. So that, that is uh, actually something that we can totally, totally do. Okay, awesome. That's that. That's using NLTK. Now, we can use the same logic that we did before to do this in plain old Python. And I just want to show this to you. So this was the NLTK way. Now let's do the plain old Python way of doing this. So we start off with exactly the same idea. But now we need to know the number of n-grams because we're going to loop. And as I told you, the number of n-grams will be the tokens plus one minus n. So let's do this. So the number of n-grams will be the length. Well, first of all, we need tokenized text again. And I know that we already done this, but I'll do it again here um, just so that we get into the habit of doing this. So tokenized text is tokenizer text. And remember, tokenizer is this function that we defined in the very beginning here. So this is still available to us, which is, which is pretty neat. We still have that. So the length of this list and the tokenizer basically gives us a list. That is the number of tokens. Length of tokenized texts. Okay, now plus one minus n. Well, we don't have an n yet, so let's define an n. So let's say n is three. And now we have the number of n-grams. Now we want a list in which we can store the n-grams. So let's create an empty list. And now we do the looping business. So for n-gram in range, number of n-grams. So we want to loop basically as often as there are n-grams. And we know how many n-grams there are mathematically. We want to append to our n-grams list. And now it gets interesting. So what do we actually do? What we do is we take our tokenized text. We then 
I shouldn't call this ngram. I should call this i because this is actually an index um, and not actually ngram. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take from our tokenized text the position, the index in that tokenized text, and then we are going or we are taking as much what follows as we want for our n. And if you are unfamiliar with this uh, particular piece of syntax here, let me just show this to you. So let's say again, we have a list and that list is one, two, three, four, right? And now what we can do is we can basically say something like uh, list one to two, and then this will give us just the second element. So one, two, two. So we can slice basically parts out of the list. One, two, three will be two and three. So basically one, two, three, including that. And this is how this uh, specific syntax works. So we're taking the first word, and then we're going until the n-gram, so to speak. Okay, let's look at the results here. And perfectly fine, we will get the n-grams. Okay, let's now wrap this into a function just to make it nice. So let's call this ngrams good old Python. Well, not grand old party, but good old Python. And this will take text and this will take an n. Now we don't need the n here, right? Let's also give this a default of three. Let's indent all of that. Tokenize text, that's perfectly fine. That's all good. Um, we can take all of that. And then ultimately we just need to return the ngrams. Now let's see if our newly created function actually works. So let's call ngrams uh, good old Python. Let's give it a text and let's say we want bigrams and run this and we get bigrams. Of course, if you have NLTK available, there is no point in building this, but this is pretty much what, what happens internally. And uh, so we're using this functionality that we can basically split strings or it's split lists in that uh, in this particular case, split lists using this slicing option. Awesome. Next exercise: frequency analysis. Okay, what do we have to do? Frequency analysis: write a script that generates a frequency table for a given text. The list should contain all types and their frequencies. Cool. Okay. So as you can see, we're building the whole corpus linguistic toolkit. And now there are, again, various solutions to that. So let's build the NLTK solution first. And this, again, will be very easy. So the NLTK solution, since we have NLTK available, we can use it, um, is actually pretty straightforward. So what we're going to do is, so we are going to need some text. Let me briefly think about what we use here. Um, let's use Wikipedia. So. Uh, Let's use that first Wikipedia text that is again Cologne, remember? And let's use that for our frequency analysis. Okay, so what we can do now is we can use NLTK and NLTK has this functionality um, for frequency uh, distributions. So what we can do is we can say frequencies, frequencies are NLTK dot probability. And you could look this up obviously. So if you could Google in, within NLTK, there's documentation, you can Google that. And then there's frequency distribution. And then we just give it a text and we need to give this tokenized text. And let's do this all in one line. So we already have a tokenizer and we want to hand cologne to that tokenizer. And if we do this, well, nothing happens, but we can now look at the frequencies. And now we get this list of frequencies not a list, it's, um, it's a freak dist data structure, it behaves like, like a dictionary. And now we could, for example, say the, and now we get the frequency for the, which is 53. The absolute frequency for, for the in the Cologne Wikipedia text is 53. Very, very, very straightforward, which is really, really cool. What's also cool is that these frequency distributions can be plotted. So NLTK allows us to uh, plot these very easily. So we can just call plot on them and plot this. So we'll take a second and now we can see the frequency distribution here. So it's not pretty, but it works. So down here we have all of the words and then here we have the counts. And 
funnily enough, well, expectedly, um, this is also a Zipfian distribution. So we have a large amount of low frequency items, and then we have a tiny amount of, um, well, tiny amount of high frequency items. So these here are the high frequency items with high counts. And then we have lots and lots and lots of items with low frequency counts. Pretty, pretty neat. But what if we don't have NLTK? What if we don't have NLTK available? So again, the Python solution, and we're going to use something that's called a counter. And that's actually a, a very, very, very useful function within Python. So we need to import again, we need to import something. So I'm going back up here. And this time we are going to, from collections, import counter. For now, just roll with me. And a counter essentially allows us to count the elements in a given list. So we can use this. So uh, let's say we have a list. Let's call counter on a list. And that list is one, 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 two, two, for example. And now if we run counter, we will get this neat little dictionary type thing here that says one, three, two, two. So it found or it counted that the one is there three times and the two is there two times. Awesome. We can totally use this to build a frequency table. So let's do it. And again, this is now very, very, very straightforward. We need our text again, and we can basically use the text from above here. So Cologne, we have that. So let's take uh, tokenized text, tokenizer, Cologne. I think it did a lowercase like that. Now we have a tokenized text cologne. And now we will simply put this into a counter, tokenized text, and then we will get back something that looks basically like the frequency distribution from NLTK, with the exception that we now can't really do things with it. What we can do is we can call most common on this. And then this will actually, oops, sorry. This will actually sort this list for us, uh, this frequency list. So we have the, of, and cologne. So function words. And then our first content word is cologne and city, which of course makes sense that uh, given that this is a Wikipedia article for, uh, about cologne. And this is how we can very, very easily create frequency tables um, using NLTK or using, um, well, good old Python, using a counter. Awesome, that was pretty straightforward, I'd say. So let's move on. Computing basic statistics. Okay, so write a script that generates the following statistics for a given search term and a set of text files. Absolute relative frequencies, the mean frequency and the standard deviation. And then maybe we also can plot D. Okay, let's do it. So let's go down here. Actually going to clear the output to keep this a little bit more, a uh, little bit cleaner. Compute basic statistics. Okay, let's start by, well, getting some data. And for data, we are going now to going to use the HUM19 corpus. And so we're going to use the hum 19 UK corpus and we are going to use text directory to load that corpus. So text directory dot text directory. And now I need to give it the path to that. And I'm going to copy paste this because I don't want to type it. And the path is this. And then also auto load true. So don't do anything here. And this will now load this corpus. Awesome. And now, since this is a fairly large corpus, this is 100 files, we also maybe want to random sample this. And we can, we can use text directory to do this. So hum19.uk, filter by. Now we're offered all the filters. And we're going to filter by random sampling. And let's say we get 10 files, maybe. And then we also possibly want to lowercase all of that. So we are going to stage a transformation. 
which means we are going to transform that text and we're going to use the transformation lowercase to do that. Okay. Uh, oh, I forgot the brackets here. How it works. And now, finally, what we can do is we can now transform all of that. We're going to transform to memory. And then this will now basically give us our little corpus. We can also check. So hum19uk.print aggregation. Let's have a look at that. Awesome. So we now have 10 files. We have transformed them all to lowercase and the text is available to us. Cool. Okay, now let's go into the statistics. So what we want to do is first, we want to get the relative frequencies. Well, first let's get the absolute frequencies actually. So how do we do that? Well, for the absolute frequencies, we can already more or less use what we have, right? Because we've just, we've just built something to do that. Um, so let's do this. Let's build a function to get the frequencies. So get, let's call this get frequencies, for example, for a given text. And now this will be straightforward. So we need to first tokenize the text. We already, we will always tokenize the text. This is going to be uh, <laughs> almost getting going to be boring. So we tokenized it, and now we want to get the frequencies and the frequencies for this particular thing. We're just going to use this counter method. So we are handing the tokenized text into the counter, just as we did before. And then we are going to return these frequencies. And now we have a function that gets us the frequencies. Awesome. Now let's write or build something that can give us relative frequencies. So let's get define something for relative frequencies or so function that will create relative frequencies. And now, what do we need to build relative frequencies? Now, that's, a, that's an interesting question. We need the absolute frequency, then we need the overall amount of tokens, and then we also need a number that we can pick um, to which we will normalize. So, for example, we want to have a statement like, in this corpus, we have this and that many tokens for the every 10,000 words, something like that. So we need the absolute frequency. We need the number of tokens, number of tokens. And then let's, let's skip that factor and let's just hard code that into here. And now what we do is, so we return the absolute frequency divided by the number of tokens, not n grams, tokens. And then let's take, let's say 10,000 per 10,000. And that's returned us. Let's test this out. So relative frequency, not frequency, it's actually just a one frequency, relative frequency. So let's say we have, we have one in a corpus of a thousand. Let's run this and of course it's a typo. And this would be 10. So we will find 10 of those per 10,000 words, right? Obviously, since we only have a thousand words, this, not, this number is a little bit larger. Okay, this works. Now, finally, we need to build something that generates frequencies across multiple texts, right? For a certain term, because we have multiple text nows. So let's build a function. Uh, let's call this frequency across texts. So we're interested in the frequency of one particular item. We give this a search term, uh, or we need a search term. Um, that's the word we're interested in. And also a bunch of texts, right? And now we will have a frequency list. And it's empty for now. And now we're going to use the functions we just built. So for text, in texts, so we are now looping over the texts that we have, we first need to get the frequencies. So the frequencies for that text. We're getting all the frequencies for the text. We're going to use get frequencies on that particular text. And then we are going to append to our frequency list uh, append 
to our frequency list, we're going to append a frequency for that given search term. So for search term. And then ultimately, we're going to return the frequency list. Okay, so, so okay, what happened here? It's fairly complicated. What happened here? So what we do is we have a list of texts. We hand this to this function. Now, for each individual text, we are first generating a list of frequencies for this particular text, the frequency table for that text. And then we are going to do a lookup in that frequency table for the particular word we're looking at, which is our search word, uh, search term, sorry, our search term. And then we are adding that to our frequency list because we're interested in all the frequencies across these texts. Now that we have that, let's try it. So frequencies across text. The first thing we hand to this is a search term. Let's take, for example, the, because we used that. And now we hand it a bunch of texts. Okay, uh, texts, huh? Mm, okay, we have the corpus loaded, but um, we, need to get, we need to get individual texts here. The texts are actually hidden in this transformed text part here of our text directory. So we need to get that. Let's do this first. And now we're going to use one of these uh, list comprehensions I talked about. So if we get the hum 19 UK aggregation, so we can do get aggregation. This will give us a generator of all the texts. Let's make a list out of that. That's fairly straightforward. We've done that before. Let's force this to be a list. Now, if I run this, it will take a whole while because it will now try to print this list, but I want to show you. So we now get all of these 10 files, including the text. But we, we will want just the text and we want just the text in a list. So we are now building one of these list comprehensions. So what we're going to do, and you can see that uh, this is starting to lag because I loaded so much text. But what we're going to do is we are going to take the transformed text, transformed text, and this is essentially this down here, for each document in that list. And then we are going to write this into texts. And now hopefully this, hopefully I didn't do any typos. So what do we do? We have this list. These are all our files. For each document in that list, we only want the transform text and we want all of that in a new list. Okay, that ran a lot better. Let's see if that works. So let's get the zero text in that. Oops, texts. Okay, and this is the actually the first text. Awesome, so we can now do that. Okay, that's good. So now we can hand this our texts. Okay, remember we are now back at the frequency across text function. So let's run this. And beautifully, we now get all of the frequencies for the word the. So these are the frequencies for the word the in these 10 files. These are actually 10 files. Cool, so we now have them and now we can do stuff with them. So to do that, we will need these statistics because this is now basically a tiny little set of data. And now we can use the statistics module, which I talked about. So statistics dot, um, what do we want? We want the, uh, the mean. Statistics dot mean frequencies across texts. Well, let's just save that. Let's save that into a variable of the same name. And now let's get the mean. Awesome. The mean is 8,179. And then let's also, just going to copy paste this. Let's also get the standard deviation, which is ST def, I think. Yeah. Who will help me out there? And the standard deviation is 3,730. Okay. Does this work for other words too? Sure. Let's uh, say, for example, we want this for shook. Why not? Let's compute these statistics here. So the mean for shook is 10.4 and the standard deviation would be 6.5. Awesome. For the absolute frequencies, we're still doing absolute frequencies here. 
briefly think about what we need to change to use the relative frequencies. We have this function here, um, frequency across texts. And this uses the getFrequencies function. And the getFrequencies function actually just uses the absolute values. So what we would need to do here is we would, for each value, before adding it here, we would actually need to do the relative frequency here. So let's just try this. So frequency across texts. Um, I'm going to copy paste this function across texts relative. And now before appending to that list, we are, well, let's, let's do this in two steps to make it a little bit more easy. So the relative frequency is relative frequency of search term. I'm going to make this very, very explicit is we are going to use relative frequency, that function. And now we are giving it the absolute frequency, which is what we used before. And then we also need the number of tokens in that text. Hmm. Okay. The text, the text in here, we get from this file here from the texts, right? Now, let me briefly think about this. Maybe, maybe I made a mistake. I'm just thinking about the fact whether we actually already tokenized this and then whether our frequencies make sense. Can you briefly think about this? Um, yeah, yeah. Since we tokenize on the get frequencies, we tokenize here. Uh, we are actually, we are actually, we are actually good. Um, good. Awesome. But what we need to do is we still need to get the number of tokens in that text. So um, how would, are we going to do this? Number of tokens. This is going to be the length of the tokenized text. And of course, um, this is computationally not very clever to do the tokenization over and over and over and over again. But let's do this here for the sake of, um, to make this very clear, number of tokens. So now we actually get the relative frequency and now we're adding the relative frequency of the search term to that list. And now we should also be able to generate a relative frequency. I'm going to copy paste this frequencies across texts are relative frequencies across text relative. Let's run this and hope for the best. Seems good so far. Let's look at the mean for relative. And now the mean is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot smaller because now we're actually working with relative data. Awesome. That's cool. But as you can see, this is very, this is getting very confusing. If you're writing all of these functions our own, if we are doing, if you're using these calculations, this is not good. And this is also not very sustainable if we want to do this across um, more texts. So what we're going to do is we're now going to use this data frame world that I already introduced you and we'll do this a little bit nicer. So let's do the same thing using pandas data frames. And to a certain extent, this is going to make things at first a little bit more complicated and then hopefully a lot more easy. So we are using the same data. We are using the uh, HUM19 UK. And we are going to start now. Sorry, we're now going to start by creating two tables, the frequency table absolute and the frequency table relative. And now instead of um, using lists, we're using dictionaries. Before we do this, we now need to establish the vocabulary in our corpus. Not in one file, but in the whole corpus. We want the vocabulary of the whole corpus. And you'll see why we need that later. So how do we do that? First, we need the, the text for the whole corpus. 
And using text directory, this is actually fairly easy. So hum19 UK, aggregate to memory. This will now get us the whole text. So the whole text of the corpus, well, of the sample, is now in this variable text. And now we're going to get the vocabulary. And the vocabulary is going to be, and now we're going to use a trick. I'm going to show this to you. Again, we need a list. So let's say the list is one, two, 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 three. Now if we print the list, it's one, two, 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 three. If we force this list to be a set, you can just call set around here and then print it, we will only get each of the elements once because in a set, there can't be duplicates. So we can use this little trick. We can use this little trick of forcing a list to be a set to remove duplicates. And that's pretty, pretty neat. So what we can do now is we basically first tokenize the whole corpus or the whole, yeah, the whole corpus in this case, the whole text. Now this will give us a list of all the tokens, right? Now to get the types, we essentially need to remove all duplicates. And we're going to do this by simply calling set. And now if we do this, we now have each word or each token that's in the corpus, but only once. We have now a set of all of the types in the corpus. That's awesome. Um, that's pretty neat. And we can now also look at how many types we have. So the length of the vocabulary would be, so we have the 32,000 types in our corpus. Okay, back to down here. So I created these two tables and this is often called initialization. So initialize the frequency tables. And I'm going to document this whole file a little bit better before I'm going to upload it. And now, now we're going to do a whole, everything we've done before, we're now going to do in basically one step. So we're now looping over all the documents. So over all the documents in hum19uk, get aggregation. These are all the documents. First things first, we will get the frequencies for that document, the doc frequencies. We have the functions for that already. We're going to use the frequencies and we are going to plug in the transformed text here. Transformed text, remember, is just the text of that particular file. So for each document, in our aggregation, we're getting the frequencies. So what we do now is we now create for each document, again, a frequency table. So we create a doc frequency list, <laughs> list absolute, and we leave that um, empty and we create a doc frequency list um, relative that's also empty because we want absolute and relative frequencies. Okay. And now, now we need to think about this for a second. So we now want to get the frequency for every single word in each of these documents. We already have the vocabulary. So what we're going to do now is we're going to loop over, over, over our vocabulary. So vocab for vocab in vocabulary. So what happens now is in this loop, we're now going to look at every single word in our corpus, not necessarily just in this file, but for every single word in this corpus. And we are now looking up for that document, whether we have a frequency here. So for vocab in vocabulary, we are going to append the frequency here. Um, so dot append, and we have the doc frequencies and we've done this before. So we are looking up the frequency for that word. And then we're also going to do the exactly the same thing, but for the relative frequency. So doc frequency list relative dot append. And now we are taking the, uh, oh yeah, yeah, sure. We need to call the relative frequency here. So relative frequency, we've done this before. We are taking the doc frequency doc frequencies for the word. And then we also need to handle the number of tokens. And this is fairly easy because the number of tokens is available to us in this 
dog object here because we get this from the text directory and text directory keeps track of the token. So we already have the overall number of tokens available here. So we do that. And now finally, and this is now why we need these up here, we will now add for each document this to our overall table. So this is our overall table for the whole corpus. And this is our, these are our frequency lists for the individual document documents. So we are going to frequency table absolute. And now we are going to use the file name as an index here. So we're going to take the file name for the file we're currently looking at, for the document we're currently looking at, and we are going to plug the frequency list, uh, sorry, the document frequency list in here. You'll see what happens in a second. Um, absolute, and then we are going to do the same thing for the frequency list relative. Relative. Now this looks this looks crazy. I I know. Uh, so I made a mistake. Let's see. Uh, doc frequency list frequency table. Absolute is not defined. Yeah, I didn't run this uh, initialization here, so we didn't have that available. And now, now comes the truth. Now we look at our frequency table absolute, for example. And now in here, we have, so this looks pretty crazy, right? These are just numbers. But if we scroll to the very top, um, or at least to one file, we have the frequencies for every single word in our vocabulary in here. Okay, so here there, there's, there's a start. So for the file 1892, for the first word in the vocabulary, we have zero. For the, or the zero of the word in the vocabulary. For the first word in the vocabulary, we have zero, and so on and so forth. So what we now do here is, we are not storing the actual token or the type, but we are now referencing this to our vocabulary. So So now we're going to build a data frame absolute. You've seen data frames, these are tables. PD dot data frame. Now the data that we want to use is our frequency table absolute. And now the, the, the cool part is we are now using our vocabulary as the index. And if I do this, I'll show you the table. It looks like that. So now we have this table. These are all of the words in our vocabulary. These are all of our files. And then these are our absolute frequencies for all of these files. Awesome. Okay, so now we have that. By the way, we can use the so-called head function to only show the first couple in couple couple of those. And now, of course, we have all the cool data frame features. So now we can do data frame absolute and now we use lock to select an individual row. So using lock, you can select a row. So for example, the, if I run this, we'll get the frequencies for in all files. And now I can use data, data frame magic and just do, for example, mean or mode or something like standard deviation. If we are interested in just uh, in, um, that was the wrong, it's ST, STD maybe. Um, is now possible to do all of that. And so of course we can now also build, or we could also build a data frame for the, um, so this is data from absolute. We could also build one for the relative frequencies. And that is awesome. If we now want to compare words, for example, let's, let's actually do this. So let's do data frame uh, relative equals PD uh, data frame. And now we need to, plug in our lovely list. So we can basically copy what we did here. Data frame relative, relative index is again the vocabulary. And now we can, let's say we wanna compare two words in our corpus. So we do df rel dot lock. And now this lock can also take multiple words. So let's say we wanna compare telegraph and the, select, select two words. 
now we will get the, the relative frequencies this time um, for these two words or these two types in all of our files, which is which is pretty neat. Okay, let's do a final thing. Let's use data frame magic to plot um, a little the, 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 this data here. So what we can do is we can use and now I'm not this is this is now fairly advanced, but it's pretty cool to do. Um, so we're going to use a re-index. And we're then doing some sort sort magic. Don't don't confuse, don't get confused too much. Um, I'll just show you how this works or what it does uh, without going into the details here. It's basically something you can copy paste. And then we're going to locate, for example, the word telegraph. And then we're going to plot all of that. And if I now didn't mess this up, this should work. So this is now a plot. So we, the, the, what we did here is first we sorted the columns because the columns in this particular case, for this particular corpus are years. So if we sort this by file name, we actually sort this by the time of appearance or by historical, uh, by historical time. So we sort this first by file name um, on the axis one, that's uh, basically the direction in the table. And once we've sorted it, we are then locating the word telegraph and we're then plotting that. So if we don't call the plot here, you'll see it sorted this. So 1807 to 1892. And then if we plot this, of course, we see that telegraph, well, over these 10 files, this is how this behaved. Now, let's do something else. Remember, we sampled 10 files. Let's get a little bit more data. Let's, uh, let's resample, um, but with 50. So we're loading everything again. Uh, we resample, but this time we take 50 files. We can basically do all of that, run all of that again. Um, we ignore this, we just go straight down to, to what we did here. And now we, of course, need to get a new vocabulary because the files have changed. So we need to generate new vocabulary. The vocabulary now should have grown. So now the vocabulary is actually 60,000 words. And now we basically run all of our little code again. All takes a little bit longer now because we have more data. And we also will calculate a new data frame relative. And now let's plot this, but this time based on 50 files. And now based on 50 files, we see a little bit more action here. If we look at, if we look at that. And this way we can plot frequencies, in this case, relative frequencies of individual words. Let's say, for example, we plot the, um, as you can see, it's a little bit more, more stable. Um, and also do, for example, A. And now we can plot this over time, over these 50 files or over the 100 files. And so we can use the magic of these data frames to do that. What we can, to, uh, what we can of course, also do uh, as a final thing is uh, let's plot Zipf's law here, since now this is fairly easy. So we will new, now create a new column. It's very easy. In a data frame, you basically just, if you want to create a new column, you just use data frame, and then you just add whatever you want here. And then if you give it data. So what we're going to do is we're giving it the sum of all the files, basically. Um, we sum this. Now, if we look at the data frame uh, rel, let's look at let's look at the uh, sum right away. Uh, not the sum, but the total. Sorry, the total. Then we get now totals for all the words. And if we now go ahead and sort those, so we just we we need to sort this actually, so that it makes so it makes any sense. So df data frame relative dot sort values. And working with these pandas data frames is fairly straightforward if you look at, at, at what, the, what, what these words were actually. And we're sorting this um, not ascending, and then we plot it. This will take quite a second because we now have all the 50 files in there, but uh, we essentially now plot for all the files and well it's, it's very over pronounced but essentially we have the same uh thing going on here where we have we're actually only plotting total um where we have this zipfian distribution here which is which is pretty neat if you think about it okay let's move on to the next exercise
And from now on, it's going to be a little bit faster. So we are now going to use NLTK to do some fairly basic stuff. So we are going to use NLTK to stem and lemmatize. And we are also going to look at a few various stemmers and lemmatizers. Because there are multiple ones, and it's important to understand um, kind, of, kind of how they work. Okay, so the first thing is we will need to download. Well, we can do this later. Um, let's first get a couple few more things in. And I'll, Im I'll do an import here now, although I do all the imports above, actually. But we're going to import these various stemmers um, into our environment. We already have NLTK, but this way we can now just use Porter Stemmer, Lancaster Stemmer, and the Lemmatizer. So what is stemming? Stemming is basically reducing um, words back to their um, root or stem in that case. So we're interested in that. And since NLTK allows us to do this, it's fairly easy. What we do is, so first we create one of these stemmers. So Porter Stemmer, and this is the oldest available stemmer, more or less. And now we have that, and now we can do something very easy. We can now call Porter Stemmer, and then we can give it a word. So for example, let's say become. And what did I do wrong? Oh, I actually did it wrong. It works like this. <laughs> so if we run this, um, it will stem this to become, basically. Um, if I give it something like connection, it will stem this to connect. And let's create now the same thing for these other pieces here. And for the lemmatizer, so a lemmatizer needs underlying data. The stemmers work using some fairly basic algorithms, and they don't need underlying data. The lemmatizer needs information about the language to effectively lemmatize. And this particular one uses data from the WordNet. And we can download additional data that we need using NLTK. So I'm going to call NLTK.download WordNet. This will just download this data that we need. And now this actually hopefully works. So now we have all of these available. So let's now play this game with the other um, stemmers. So there's also the Lancaster stemmer. We can try that. The Lancaster stemmer works quite well. And then we can also try the WordNet lemmatizer. And for the WordNet lemmatizer, the word is not stem, but lemmatize. And then add connection here. And if we run this, then this takes a little bit longer. Um, we get connection because there is actually no underlying information here. OK, so this way we can fairly easy uh, lemmatize things. And now the exercise called for a little comparison. So the idea is, let's compare how these different tools uh, work using a couple of words. So let's try this. So I'm going to copy paste uh, all of these test words in here. And now I'm just going to copy paste a little bit of code. That's actually um, coding wise fairly boring. So what we do here is for each of these words, we're going to use all of these tools. And then we're going to print the results. We're going to print the initial word. So for some connection, become, caring, our women drive, or word form, to be more precise. And then we are going to also print the result for the Porter stemmer, the result for the Lancaster stemmer, and the result for the um, WordNet lemmatizer. And let's do this. And this will give us this little result here. And now we can see. So for connection, we get connect, connect, connection. Become, 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 become. This is uh, obviously the, the this obviously works a little bit better. Caring, care, car, caring, r r a r r, woman, woman, a womb, woman, driving, drive, driv, driving. And as you can see, so of course the lemmatizer is going to give us different results because it is based on data. But the Porter stemmer and the Lancaster stemmer actually both rely on underlying algorithms, and they give us different results. Now. Arguably, the Porter stemmer gives us better results because the Lancaster stemmer does things like AR instead of R, right? And this is, this is not what we want. So why might we want to use the Lancaster stemmer, for example, over the Porter stemmer? That's a good question. 
And the answer lies in the fact that the Lancaster stemmer is a little bit more aggressive and also it is quite a bit faster. And we can use a little magic function in here called time it. And with time it, we can basically time um, how fast something, how, some, how fast something runs. So let's try this. So let's time the Porter stemmer and let's, for example, let it, let it stem become. And if we now run this, it'll take a second because it now runs this a couple of thousand times to then estimate a, um, a time for that. So we did 10,000 loops and we, for the best of the three, we took 19 uh, microseconds per loop to run this. Now let's do the same thing, but for the Lancaster stemmer. And for the Lancaster stemmer, you see that that already worked a lot, a lot faster. So for 10,000 loops, we took for the, um, for the time-wise, we only took 8.5 microseconds. So the Lancaster stemmer is a lot faster. Um, we can finally also look at the, um, if we wanted to do this, at the lemmatizer, how long that, how long that takes. And that's going to be interesting. So. Let's do that and also let's do this also with become. Let's run this and let's see how long this takes. And this is actually pretty fast. Um, this is actually the fastest out of all of these because it uses this underlying data. So if we already have that, that's pretty neat. We can, we can use that. Um, but of course, it will only work if the underlying data has information on what we want to lemmatize. So these stemmers are in many cases more universal. But if we just compare these two stemmers, so arguably the Porter stemmer is better, right? But it also takes twice as long. And now for one word, obviously this is not a big deal, but let's say we wanna stem a really, really, really large corpus, then this actually sums up. And then it could be interesting to use an approach that is just faster, although less accurate. Okay, the final thing I want to do with um, NLTK is to show you what WordNet can do. And I'm first going to import WordNet here. I'm going to do it in the right, in the right spot and should have done it with the stemmers too, uh, actually. So what is WordNet? Um, so WordNet is actually a database. It's a lexical database for English um, at Princeton University. So WordNet is a large lexical database of English. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs are grouped into sets of cognitive synonyms called synsets, each expressing a distinct concept. And we can now use this database within Python using NLTK to, for example, look for metaphors, uh, not metaphors, sorry, for synonyms. And we do this by using WordNet. We now have WordNet available. So, um, can do the following. So let's say we are interested in our let's do a search term, and let's say the search term is fantastic. And now for synset, so we are getting all the synsets for fantastic for synset in WordNet dot synset for our search term, uh, search term, not search word. We want to print the synset. Let's run this. Did I do wrong? I don't have values to be too able to unpack. Interesting. For sin set in ordinate sin sets, it needs to be sin sets. Yeah. Uh, now we get these sin sets. These don't tell us much because a sin set in itself has things in it. So we need a second for loop in here. So for the name in the synset, you know, for each of these synsets, we will get all the lemma names and then we will print just the actual name. And now we get for each of these synsets, we get the actual names. And these are, well, at least allegedly now synonyms to fantastic. And we get wonderful, fantastic, wild, fantastical, uh, grand, also grotesque, um, and so on and so forth. We can use the WordNet search to see what's happening here. I already did this. So if we search in WordNet using this web interface, we can see the synsets here. So these are the synsets, and we get a synset 
um, for these are basically particular groups, as they argue, um, expressing a distinct concept. So this is a concept mapping. So we have different concepts here, and then for each concept, we are getting these synsets. And in this Python version that we just did, we're basically stripping away the fact that these are actually concept groups, and then we're doing this. So for example here, um, fantastical and grotesque, uh, ludicrously odd, um, is grouped together, and um, grand, howling, marvelous, marvelous, rattling, terrific, tremendous, wonderful, and wondrous are grouped together. And basically the way we do this, because we just list them, we kind of ignore the fact that there's underlying categories. But this is very, very interesting, and this is cool that we can use this within our code, actually. So that is very neat. OK, that's that. Let's now look at exercise 13, spacey tagging. Spacey is another library, another NLP library, and it's probably my favorite library of all. So NLTK is great, but NLTK is, it, it's very old, very cool, but uh, it's not actually being used that much in, in production. So we are now going to use Spacey to do a lot of things, and Spacey is just amazing. So uh, let's have a look at that. We need to first import Spacey, so that we have that, so import Spacey. Now we have that available, and Spacey um, works based on underlying language models. So we are going to use Spacey now for tagging. Spacey can do a lot of things, but tagging is one of the things it is really good at. Um, I'm going to copy paste this in here from above. This is again Wikipedia, so we are reloading Wikipedia, so to speak. And if I say we are loading Wikipedia, we're loading the three texts that we have available uh, in this repository. Okay, so now in Spacey, we first need to load a model. So, and this works by, this is traditionally called NLP. So we are going to do spacey load, and now we're loading a model, and we're going to use en core web sm here as our model, and let's see. We go to the spacey website, this is the spacey website. So they have multiple models available. You can also build your own models, and these models are based on deep learning. Um, so these, these are basically deep learning models, uh, and you can pick various languages here, so we are going to use English. And then down here, you can see all of the models available. So for English, we have three models available. There is the EN Core Web Small, and this is an English multitask uh, CNN trained on onto nodes. So this is actually the underlying data um, for that particular model. And we are using this. This is the smaller model. There's also larger models, for example, EN Core Web LG, um, which is 750 megabytes. And this is trained on on two nodes, the on two nodes corpus and the glove common crawl corpus or data source. If you're using the small model, because that is um, that is actually um, fine for our purpose, because we are not interested in too much uh, too much precision here, and it's faster to run this this way. And a CNN, by the way, is a uh, convolutional neural network, and these are often used in in this these types of tasks. OK, so we're loading the model like this. And now we can create documents. And this is pretty neat because we can now use this model to do all of the things that we want to do. So we're now creating a document. And the document is the actual text. So we are now using this model by calling NLP. And now we are, we are giving this the text. And this text, in this case, let's take Wikipedia, get text, and let's, uh, in this instance, let's take the first text here. And now this is being processed. It's quite quick because the text is very short. And now we have this doc uh, thing. If we just look at that, um, we just get the text back. And this is not a Wikipedia article on linguistics. But now this is not just a text, but this is now a fully blown spacey object. So we can now do, for example, so the easiest thing is we can um, look for individual sentences. So for sent in doc.sense, print the sentence. And well, let's print the sentence and then also a, a new line so that we get each sentence on one line. And now we get each sentence in our text in one line. So we can use this already to split text into sentences. Very, very cool. And this is not being done based on, uh, we just split the 
at, at certain um, characters, but this is based on this underlying model of English, which is very, very cool. But of course, uh, looking at sentences is, well, it's, it's cool that it's possible, but it's still not really what we wanna do. What we wanna do is we wanna look at individual tokens and these tokens here are now tagged already. So what we can do is, so we can do for token in the document and we are now only, let's look, let's only look at the first 10. So for token and document, and we are slicing. So the first 10 in this uh, thing, and now let's print the token, token.text, that's the best basic thing. These are just, this is just a text, right? What we can also do, let's add this here, token.lemma, still not too interesting. Uh, so there is a lemmatizer in here um, that works really, really well. So is has been lemmatized to be, and um, for example, involves has been lemmatized to involve. Okay, let's go further. Let's also look at the token um, tag, for example, and now we get the parts of speech. So linguistics, lemmatized version is linguistics and the parts of speech, um, it's a noun. Is, be, verb, the, the, determiner. Awesome, so now we have access to these parts of speech as well. So this is already tagged, very, very cool. What also happens in the background is named entity recognition and named entity recognition is also based on these models and this will find well so-called named entities and these are for example it's based on the model but this is for example names or places or numbers things like that so we can do let's, let's look at the first 10 named entities in here and let's print them so let's print uh entity.text text scroll down that you can see something and also entity.label and now if we do this, we actually get, so this is all being done automatically now. We, for example, get certain, so for example, 6th six, century is a date. Um, and today is a date. And well, Sanskrit is actually not a person, uh, but a language. So the model got this wrong, possibly because we only have used a smaller model. So if we use larger models, this possibly gets a little bit better. We can try. While this happens, I also, because Spacey also allows us to plot things, very neat, and we need to import something called Displacey. Displacey is the plotting library or the graphing library in Spacey. So, done a lot of things already going up here, and we're also going to import Displacey. So from Spacey, import Displacey, sounds fun. And then we can already, kind of prep uh, what follows because the next thing we want to do and that's just the last thing we want to do kind of with spacey now is you want to plot the named um not just the parts of speech and the named entities but also the dependencies so we can use displacey uh once it is available and we will render a sentence we need to get a sentence actually actually so sentence will be and we're just going to take next and next gets the next element um, in a uh, from a generator so we are going to once everything has finished we are going to displace using displacey the sentence and the style is going to be dependencies and then i have to put jupyter true because we're in jupyter notebooks right now and universal dependencies it's a model uh, it's a syntax model that um, basically uses relationships between nodes in, for example, a sentence. So you would have a root node, usually the um, usually a verb, and then it will give you uh, relationships. So for example, a determiner has a relationship, a dependency to the root. So for example, if the root is a noun, let's say the, the root is city, and then you have a determiner, the, then there will be a relationship between these two and the universal dependencies uh, show you these. So the download has finished. Okay, unfortunately it doesn't work like that. Uh, probably we could figure this out, but let's go with the small model for now then. Um, if you wanna do this on your own PC, it probably, it probably works. And then you can use the larger model and then maybe the uh, entities work a little bit better. Well, we can look at more entities and then see if, if this actually helps us, but there aren't that many in here actually. So maybe let's use another text and look for that. So let's, let's look at the Cologne text for a second. 
So we're going to do all of that for the cologne text. Don't need the sentences. Um, let's look at the first 10. So, okay, we, we, that, that still works. And let's look at the entities now. And so here's a, here's a bit more. So for example, we get geographical locations, about 45 kilometers, that's a quantity, um, cardinal numbers, Dusseldorf is a location, and so on and so forth. So this works quite well, even with this a very small model. Now let's try this place here. And oop, this is very large. Let me zoom out a little bit. And this works really, really well. So now we see these relations here. So for example, city, it's a noun, and largest, the adjective largest has a relationship with city and that's a modification. So city is being modified by largest and you can see that here. Um, or if we go down here, um, North Rhine Westphalia, for example, um, compound. Um, and then, although there are some mistakes in here, it's not perfect because we're using that very small model, of course. Um, so that's, that's a big issue. This automatic tagging, of course, is always dependent on the underlying models that we use, but it's still a, a good exercise. And Spacey is just, Spacey is just awesome. Spacey also can do all the things NLTK uh, can technically do. So in production, actually, I would recommend essentially only using Spacey. Yeah, so what we could do is, that's maybe interesting. We can go back to the frequency example. Um, here are the engrams. Let's go to the frequency, frequency task. And maybe let's also do this once briefly in Spacey so that you see, because we've done an LTK, we can also do it in Spacey. Um, so let's add that here. And in Spacey, so I'm going to just copy paste this. And we need a little bit of text here. So we already have Cologne, so let's use Cologne. So we're going to plug Cologne in here, going to zoom in a little bit more. And so we are tagging Cologne using Spacey. Let's run this. Awesome. And now we can get the frequencies. Uh, there is a, so there's a count by method for these documents. Very easy. Uh, so frequencies equals doc.countby. And now we have to tell it by what we actually want to count. So we, for example, could also count by parts of speech, which could be useful. And we do this by calling spacey attributes, IDs, and then um, ORT for or orthographic. And I'll run this. And now if we look at the frequencies, this will look very, very strange. <laughs> it will look like that. And this is now the perfect chance to remember back what we did manually when we looked at our little vocabulary here. So um, in Spacey, there's also a vocabulary. And in this vocabulary, things have individual IDs. And so here we don't get the, the word, but we get the ID. You can actually check that. So what we can do is we can basically do doc.vocab. That's the vocabulary. And now we can take one of these things here, for example, that this one is very, very common, 53 times, probably also a boring one. And if we do this, okay, that's the. Okay, so what if we wanna do this? Um, I'm just going to copy paste some code in here. So for tag and count in frequency items, so we're looping over the frequencies and then we're getting the human readable form, which is exactly what we've done here, but for all uh, the counts, and then if we run this, we just get a frequency list like we did um, with an LTK or with our own version. Okay, I just wanted to show you that this is also possible. Let's go down here and let's do these last exercises. Okay, parsing XML. So XML parsing, very important because lots of corpora um, are XML based. And if we wanna work with this data, we kind of need to be able to, to do this. So let's do that for a second. And we are going to use two methods again. So we are going to, first of all, do it, you do, it, do this using regular expressions, and then we're going to do it using a library. And actually I'm going to import that library already. So import lxml. There are multiple ones for xml, but lxml is one that works quite nice. But let's do this step by step. So first of all, we will need some xml data. And I'm going to, again, copy paste um, some, some boilerplate code in here. 
So in our repository, I just opened this up, there is this example code here. So in the folder XML, there is this code here. And this looks like, this is called BNC style, because this, it's not from BNC, but it looks like the BNC. So we have a sentence, the sentence has a number, and there are words in here, and these words have parts of speech. And um, well, it, it basically looks like the BNC. And we are going to use this as an example now. Okay, so if we print this, so we read the file, we just get the file here. And now let's first use regular expressions uh, to do this. So this is going to be the regular expressions variant of this. And to do that, um, so we're, we're going to do this with a function right away. So find elements re. And by the way, so the task is parsing XML, write a function that allows you to extract all the elements with a given attribute from an XML file. So the idea is, for example, we want to find all the verbs in a corpus. Um, and for this particular corpus or for this particular style, we would need for the we would need to look for the attribute POS, parts of speech, verb. And then we want to get have and bought for this example. Okay, so what do we what do we actually need? We need some XML some text basically we need an attribute and we then also want to look for a specific attribute value let's build a regular expression for that and we've done this before but now we need to figure this out okay so let's go back to regxr and i'm going to copy paste the sample in here and now we need to so what we want is we want basically these lines here right that have parts of speech verb here and so what we do is okay so we start by looking for the brackets here and then we look for something basically whatever there comes until we find our attribute and our attribute would be pos equals okay um then we know that these attributes uh, or these values are always in these marks so we do a mark then we do our um, the actual value that we want, so verb. Okay, and then we need to match whatever comes after that because possibly there is more. In this case, there isn't, but it could be that there is something behind there, right? So, what if what if there's something there? So we're looking for that, and then we are closing that. And now we need a group because we now want to match what's in that element. So we are going to use a group and looking for all of that. And then we also need to close this off. We don't know that it's word necessarily. So we are, we are matching for everything. So this is our regular expression. Um, we are matching this bracket here. Then we are matching something until we find POS equals verb. Then if there is something else, we just take this. Then we take as a group, whatever is in that element, and then this is just a the closing the closing um, tag here. And since we don't necessarily know that it's a W, we just take all of it. So we could just also use W, but uh, let's make this a little bit more uh, inclusive. Okay, so that's kind of the regular expression for for a verb. Okay, now what we want to do is we want to have this a little bit more universal or generalized, so that we can put in attributes and, and attribute values, however we want to. And the way we are doing this is this. So we are going to build that regular expression, but instead of having a verb and, uh, instead of having POS and verb in here, we are plugging in the attribute and the attribute value into this regular expression that we just built. And then we do X and L elements equals reg X find all reg, whoops, regex uh, XML. So we're matching the regular expression on all of the XML. And then we are returning, well, what are we returning? If we're now returning the XML elements, that's everything, right? Um, let's do this, let's try this. And let's run this function. So find elements, regular expressions. Um, we are giving that our XML from above, XML. The attribute would be pause. And what we're looking for is verb, right? So let's run this. Well, that kind of worked. So we got this um, back what we wanted. It's two group. It's um, it's uh, it's two results, and these are groups. 
and because we used grouping. So this is what we're actually interested in, right? So uh, within these findings, we are looking for the first element here because we don't want the whole thing. We just want uh, the, the actual verb. So let's do this. So instead of returning the whole element, we are going to use again a list comprehension and we're going to do element one for element in XML elements. So always only take the first element and let's run this again. And now we get half and bot, but uh, well, there is a space character here. So maybe we can get rid of this. So let's do elements.strip and strip removes white space surrounding a string. So if we run it now, we get just what we wanted. Okay, works decently enough. However, if there are any edge cases, if the XML for some reason looks a little bit different, if something is off, this won't work. So what we want is we want a more robust solution. And to do this, we are going to parse our text. And parsing means that we are actually going to use XML as, as what it is. It's a, it's a language basically. And we are going to look for all the elements, build a tree out of that, and then we are going to navigate that tree. Okay. So we are going to build a function again. So def find elements lxml this time. And we're going to put xml in there, the attribute again, and the attribute value. And now, oops, I'm in a text field. That doesn't work. We need to put this into a code field, and this is going to be the lxml solution. And here, we are going to first build a tree and the tree is going to be lxml.etree. That's just what's called within lxml parse. And now we, lxml take, only takes files. It's a little bit strange, but it only takes files. And so we need to use a little trick. And that trick is that we can use a specific IO function. Um, called string IO, where we basically uh, take a string and we pretend that it's a file. Looks a bit strange, but it, it should actually, uh, should work. So we are going to use string IO um, on XML. And that will basically pretend now that this is um, a file. And now we get the root. So XML essentially is always a tree. It's always a tree structure. Um, so for, so root is going to be tree dot get root. So this is the root element now. And now we can use LXML. The elements are going to be root, find all. It's very neat. You can basically look for things. And now we need to, to use again, something new that's called XPath. And XPath allows us to navigate uh, XML. So the specific thing we're looking at, I'm going to copy paste this in here, looks a little bit like that, or not a little bit, looks exactly like that. So we are looking for a W element with this attribute and this attribute value. And this is this X path syntax. And I can show um, this to you how this works. So if we do X path, so I'm going to, to build another tree here and I'm going to use the X path example here. It's another file. This file looks like that. Um, and the XPath file here is a bit longer. So we have a document and then within that document, we have pages and then within these pages, we have sentences and within these sentences, we have words, okay? So we now want to navigate this. So for example, we want to select all the verbs on page one, let's do that. So what we can now do is we can now do elements and this is very neat if you, if you get used to this. So we can do tree find all. And now we are looking for page. So this indicates that we are looking um, at the root element. Uh, and then we are looking for a page number. We're looking for page number uh, one in that example. And then we want a sentence and then we want a word and we want a word with the attribute pos equals uh, equals a verb. 
And if we now run this, I probably made a mistake. Page number one. I didn't close the bracket. Um, okay. And now if we look at that, we should actually get that. Well, we need to uh, loop over that. So for, uh, now we can just do a list, uh, list comprehension again. So element.text or element in elements. And then we get these two things here, um, which should work nice. So page one, we're looking for parts of speech verb. And that is what we get. Verb was and smelled. Awesome. Let's do a second example. And for that second example, let's say we want to have the first word on the, in the second sentence on page two. So let's do elements equals three dot find all again. And now we need to do an XPath again. So find page. Now we need to do an attribute again, page number two in that case. And now we use something special. We want S and now we can indicate which one. So the, the second one, S and then we want the first word. And let's look at that. And well, okay. Uh, made the same mistake again. So element.txt for element in elements, they. Awesome. And this is the page two, second sentence, they. So this X path kind of, it, it almost works like file paths but for navigating XML trees. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat um, and it's cool that we have that. So we are going to use just that. Uh, this was like a little um, excerpt here. So we're going to use this. And now in our function, we are going to do the same thing we just did before for element in elements um, print. We're not going to just print them element.text. Now, where's the mistake? Obviously, there is a mistake somewhere. I added uh, way too many of these uh, marks. Okay, and now we should be able to run this. So now we can do find elements lxml. Let's give this xml. Let's give this pause, uh, pause, and verb. And then hopefully this will return exactly the same thing. Awesome, um, but in a much more robust way using using that. Okay, let's move on to the uh, 15th uh, exercise number 15, web scraping. So the idea here is to download a website for a corpus. So write a function that scrapes the text from a given website. The function should take a URL as an input and return the text present on a given website. So this is now um, something very different. It's a very different uh, programming task because we're now downloading data from the web. But it's very interesting. And um, since there will be boilerplate, so stuff that we don't want, we maybe also want to remove that. And we're going to look at how to do this. So again, we're going to build an easy solution and then we're going to build a slightly more complicated version of that. So the easy version um, is just going to be uh, HTML and parsing, let's call it that. And we again need a couple more libraries to do that. So we are going to do a couple more imports here. And what we are going to import is, so let's do some, let's do web here. We are going to import requests as library that allows us to do web requests, so get websites. We are also going to, from BS4, import beautiful soup. That, that, that's it. Beautiful soup. That allows us to parse um, HTML just as we parsed XML right now. And we're also going to import uh, just text. And this will allow us to remove boilerplate. Okay, so let's go back to the exercise here, exercise 15. And now let's do that. Okay, so let's say we wanna scrape Wikipedia pages or download Wikipedia pages. So we are going to write a function called scrape Wikipedia, and we are going to take in just a URL uh, where we can find that website. And now it's very simple. So we get the HTML code by requests.get. Uh, 
uh, and then the URL. So this will download, so to speak, the website. And now oh, we could we could just use that uh, to look have a look at that. So we just return HTML. We now run this. So scrape Wikipedia, and I have an example here. So let's say we want to look at the COVID article. We only get a response. 200 response is uh, fine. We got something. We can also now return the text. So let's do that. Um, oops, and I did it twice. And if we now run this, we will get the HTML code. And HTML looks very similar to XML um, of that Wikipedia page. And now we need to parse that. And we can do this using beautiful soup, which works very similar to LXML. So um, we can do beautiful soup. And then we'll give that our uh, HTML content, not just the text, but the whole content. And now we will need to find the content that we are actually interested in. So we're going to do a soup find, but now we need to know what we're actually looking for, right? So let's have a look at Wikipedia for a second. So this is the Wikipedia page. And now we need to figure out what we actually want. So we want this main text here. So I'm going to open up by pressing F12, the so-called developer tools. And I'm now going to select the element that I, that I actually want. And so here now I can see, so this is the tree. Looks very similar to XML. Um, and I can see that the text is actually in a div element with the ID body content. So we have a div with an ID body content. And that's what we actually want. OK, so soup find. And with soup find, we can now look in, in the, this tree for things. So we're looking for a div. And we also know that this div has an ID, and that ID is body content. And so we want to find that in the response that we get. And then instead of returning all the text, we just want to respond, uh, re we just want to return the text for that piece of content. Okay, so let's do that. And let's have a look here. And now we just get the, basically the text for that. Okay, that is neat. But of course, the issue here is that this now only works for Wikipedia articles, and it only works as long as Wikipedia actually does it exactly this way. So it's not very robust. So let's build a more robust version using um, just text again. And I call this just text magic because it's actually, so there's a lot going on with this library in the background that we're not going to discuss. But what just text does is it allows us to strip boilerplate and boilerplate, if I say boilerplate, I mean basically all of that. So for example, here, Wikipedia, main page, contents, all of this stuff that is not really relevant to us. We want to strip that away. That's boilerplate. And just text um, helps us in doing that. So let's do um, that. So we're going to build a new function, scrape, scrape Wikipedia. And this time uh, we do uh, the just text variant of it. And again, we're just taking in a URL. And now uh, the first part looks very similar to um, the rest. So we, got, we do requests, get URL. And now, so just text uh, works based on paragraphs. So now we do paragraphs equals. And now we can do just text, just text. <laughs> um, and we give it the HTML content, just as we did with beautiful soup. And now we do just text dot, uh, get stop list, and we give it an English stop list so that it has some, some context. Now this will get all the paragraphs, and now we want to add them together. So we're going to create an empty list called text. Now we are looping over all the paragraphs. So for paragraph in paragraphs, we're going to loop over that. And now it gets even more complicated because now we need to figure out whether the paragraph we're looking at is actually boilerplate or not. So if not, paragraph is boilerplate. So this is now an if construction, but the other way around. So if paragraph is not boilerplate, uh, like that, then, and only then, we want to append that paragraph, uh, paragraph, 
dot text to our text. And then we are going to return that. So bottom line, we use just text to extract all of the paragraphs from our HTML. Then we are looping over all the paragraphs and checking whether this is boilerplate. And this is the magic behind uh, just text. This just works. And if it is not boilerplate, we append it to our list and then we're returning the whole list. So let's see if this works. So scrape Wikipedia. We are going to use the same uh, URL here. And oh, I, I probably mistyped paragraphs. Oh yeah, I mistyped, I mistyped it here. Uh, very common issue. Pent like that. And now if we run this again, we get all of the text. Symptoms of COVID-19 are highly variable and so on and so forth. And this looks, this looks pretty good. Um, and we get each paragraph as one item in the list, which is very cool. Let's say we didn't want this to be uh, individual paragraphs per list, so we want to combine these. So let's say we want to combine the paragraphs. We could do this using a list comprehension. Um, so then we could do text equals, and let's join them together just with a, uh, with a, a space. So join the text and then return it. And now it's just one large string. Okay, that is how we can download pages. And now for the final exercise, we're already there. Well, already after two and a half hours, we're going to put everything together. And so the goal of this last exercise is to build a keyword system. So what are we going to do is we're going to use our web scraper. And we're going to build a small Wikipedia corpus. Let's say three to five articles. Then we'll download a reference corpus. Well, we've already done that. Then we'll generate frequency lists for these two corpora. And then we are going to implement a key in statistics. We're going to use simple math. And then we're going to determine the keywords in that um, corpus or comparing these two, these two corpora. Okay, let's do it. So step one. Step one is compiling a Wikipedia corpus. That's the first step that we want to do. Okay, so we already have our scrape Wikipedia function and we can use that. Now we need articles. Let's look. So let's build a list of article URLs. And I thought we might could start with, um, let's, let's look for, for example, let's, let's do linguistics. Uh, so let's look for linguistics. And so let's take this linguistics article as our first article. And I'm just going to paste the URLs in here. And then let's look at a related article. So let's, for example, also take social linguistics. Why not? And I just want articles that are somewhat related so that we'll find keywords uh, in, this, in this particular example, linguistics keywords. And then let's also take uh, language change and let's also add this to our list. Okay, these are the, the articles that we want. And now we want them to be, we want one string that contains all of that data. So we're going to create an empty string here. And now we can use our new function. So let's do that. So let's do for URL in article URLs. So we are looping over these. And now we are adding the text to uh, not the text, we're adding the um, result to Wikipedia. And we can use this plus equals and plus equals works like that. So if you have uh, a equals hello, and then if you do a plus equals world, these two, well, I should also print it. Uh, otherwise this doesn't make too much sense. If we then print it, we get hello world, right? So we can, we can put these together and we are now going to get, use our scrape Wikipedia function and we're going to plug in the URL here. And hopefully this will then give us a corpus or at least a tiny corpus, one little, one large string. So Wikipedia is now all of that text. And now do one, let's, let's do one more thing. Let's um, lower that. So let's do Wikipedia.lower so that we have a lowercase uh, version of that. 
Okay, so we got the Wikipedia corpus, at least something of a uh, something in, in, in line with a corpus. And now we need a reference corpus. And for this, we are going to um, do something very basic. We are going to use the COCA sampler. And uh, at the very beginning of, of this, we already downloaded that. And so we are going to use text directory again. So we're going to use COCA sampler. We're using text directory dot text directory and directory equals and i've already copy pasted copy pasted this um and the coca sampler has a couple of files I'm going to use auto load again auto load is true and now since we already lower cased the wikipedia corpus we are going to do the same thing for the reference corpus so we are going to stage a transformation uh, as we did before and the transformation is going to be transformation um lowercase transformation lowercase awesome and then we let's run this and then we are going to put the text in a variable called um reference corpus so we're going to take the coca sampler and we're going to aggregate to memory which means that all of the files in that folder are now going to be combined into one string and that string will then be in reference corpus and the string is also going to be lower cased so let's do this this will oh, went fairly quickly awesome so we have that okay now uh probably for the most complicated step we need to generate frequency lists also something we've already done but uh let's do this so remember when we did the frequency lists we first generated a vocabulary and we're going to do the same thing again so vocabulary is equals again set then we can use our tokenizer again our trusty tokenizer and now for our trusty tokenizer we need actually both corpora so we need the vocabulary in both the reference and our target corpus so we can do this by uh, passing the uh, reference corpus plus our um wikipedia to that this will probably take take a second because we're now tokenizing now we have the vocabulary of both of these um corpora and now we're going to build our frequency table so the frequency table for this is going to be a dictionary again and now we are going to do um a for loop okay so what, what do we need to do we need to basically loop over our two corpora and then we need to add the frequencies for both of these to our frequency table okay cool so let's do that so let's do this so for i and corpus in enumerate and we're going to use enumerate i'm going to show you what this does And we are going to plug in our two corpora here, so Wikipedia and reference corpus. And before we, we before we go on, let me show you what enumerate does. So let's say we have a list again. I'm doing this all over again. So let's say we have a list uh, with A, B, and C. Okay. And now if we do so we could just loop over this. So for, let's say, i and l, uh, print l, right? We've done this before. But now what we can also do is we can do for i dot, uh, let's do uh, e comma i in l, print e and i. And, oops, I forgot the enumerate. Actually, that's what I wanted to show. Um, and now we get also um, a count and an index. So this will now give us two values. And E is basically the index for where we are in that looping process. And we're going to do this here. So I in this example is going to be the number. So the corpus, the Wikipedia corpus will get the number zero and the reference corpus will get the number one. And we are now going to refer to these corpora by these numbers. So now we're going to do um, a frequency list. So we are now 
we're doing one corpus after the other, right? And this frequency list is going to be, well, a list. Now we need to get the corpus frequencies corpus frequencies and we can use our old get frequencies function that we built and we're going to plug in the corpus here and then we're going to do the same thing we did before so for vocab in the vocabulary we are going to append the frequency to the frequency list so frequency list dot append now we have the corpus frequencies um, and we're going to look up the word that we're looking at at the moment we're going to do this and then ultimately we are going to add this set of frequencies to our frequency table above so to the large frequency table and we are as our index here we are going to use i so our corpus index um, so zero for the wikipedia corpus or for the target corpus and one for the reference corpus and this then is going to be our frequency uh, or we want, to, we want to assign our frequency list which we generated to that. Let's see if I uh, didn't make any typos this time. Looking good. And now we are going to build a data frame out of that. So a data frame, uh, let's, let's, let's call this a keyness data frame, or no, let's do data frame keyness. And uh, we are going to do a PD data frame frequency table and as the index again we are using our vocabulary and remember this is that idea here um, where we have the vocabulary and then use that as an index let's do this and now we have that and we can also have a look at this of course so data frame keyness dot head okay so now we have the frequencies um, for these two corpora which is which is really cool um however oops however we did the absolute frequencies and we maybe want to do relative frequencies if we then do comparisons and that's a bit of a question if we do this now or if we do this later since we're going to use simple math we're going to do this um normalization in a later step. So remember that we are now working still with absolute values. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so the next step is then to actually do our Kina statistics. So Kina statistics. And let's do this. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to find a Kina statistics and we could now use log likelihood or something like that. But uh, to make our lives easier, we are going to do simple math. And simple math, essentially um, developed by Kilgoriff, uh, looks like this. So it's called simple math parameter, um, which is that. And we are going to take the relative frequency for our target corpus uh, plus a factor called k. Um, and that's essentially a filter. So if we want um, lower frequency items, we can change this and then we divide this by the relative frequency for the reference and add the same k and then this will give us a number and that number kind of indicates this word appears for example if number is two and we could say this number appears twice as often um, for example in the target than it is that it appears in the reference okay first step we need to build a function that actually does this smp calculation so let's do def smp and what do we need so we need the frequency for the word in corpus zero and we need the frequency for the word in, C, in corpus one and we need the um, overall number of tokens in corpus zero and we need the overall number of tokens in corpus one and we also need a k and let's define this as a default for 100. so cs0 and cs1 are the overall token counts let's now do all of that we already have functions to calculate relative frequencies. So the relative frequency for word um, C0 equals the, so we can use our relative frequencies function, relative frequency function. We're going to plug in F, uh, F word zero, and we are going to plug in CS zero. And then we're going to do the same thing for word. Let's do relative frequency. That's a little bit better, uh, just in terms of keeping track. And let's do relative frequency F 
word C1 and C as one in there. Awesome. Now we can calculate the SMP. So the SMP is then going to be fairly straightforward. The relative frequency of word C0 plus K divided by the relative frequency for word C1 plus K, and then we return the SMP. Awesome. So now we have the SMP function. Let's briefly build some intuition about that. So whether this actually works. So let's call this. So let's say we have a word that appears a thousand times. That's the word one. And we have a word that appears a hundred times. And the corpus size is equal. So we have two corpora, each a thousand words. Um, if we run this, we get uh, nine, point, nine point something. And that is due to our K. Um, so we can now say that this appears about uh, nine times as often uh, in the one corpus than it does in the other. So this is, this is really neat. It seems, to, it seems to work, so we can actually use that. Okay, so what do we do now? Now we need to calculate these SMP values for all the words. And now we are going to use some more pandas magic, and we are actually creating a new column, uh, an SMP column. And this SMP column, we are now using a specific method called apply. And now this again is a little bit out of scope for this. We're going to use a so-called lambda function. And it's a very cool concept, but I'm not going to explain it here because it goes far beyond what we want to achieve. So let's just go with it. It looks like that. So we do a uh, lambda. And then for each row, we take SMP. So we are now calling this function. And the, 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 the apply method basically runs this function for each row in our, uh, in our data. So if we have a look at that, so let's say we have a data table that looks something like, do uh, this in white, that looks something like this. And then we have rows, so 0, 1, 2, 3. Let's say like that. And now if we um, run apply like this, we can basically put in a function here. And then this function will be applied to all rows, one after the other. And what we do with this lambda function is we are, so let's say we also have columns, so let's say A and B. Using this lambda function, we can access these columns while we are running the function. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do um, row zero. And row zero here now is actually, the zero is actually the column. Row one. And this probably gets a little bit easier if we have our um, data frame keyness uh, in view. So we are going to take the frequency for the word in corpus one, that's the first column here, or the zeroth column. We're going to take the frequency for the other corpus, that's uh, row one here, or column one. And then we are going to take uh, CS, uh, CS0 and CS1, which we, haven't, uh, which we haven't yet determined, and we are going to do this on axes uh, one. So let's, before we do this, uh, we need to establish uh, ZS0, and this is going to be the length of our tokenized Wikipedia corpus. Wikipedia, and CS1 is going to be the length of our tokenized uh, reference corpus. And again, tokenizing everything all over again um, is a little bit excessive but I hope that this makes it a little bit more explicit uh, what's going on. So now we have CS0 and CS1, and now we can run this, uh, hopefully. So, oh, I put the colon here. So what this does is this lambda function, it takes this, so apply basically, uh, apply, you can think of apply as a loop. So apply provides a row, and now we can access that row in this lambda, lambda function here. So this is now basically, imagine a for loop over the whole table, we get these rows and then we can access individual columns for these rows. So this is what's happening here. And now if we look at 
I did it to the wrong data frame. Uh, we need to do it to the data frame Kinas. Now, if I look at the data frame Kinas, we see nothing, which is awesome. So let me let me briefly. Oh, sure. I need to apply the correct data frame here um, because the data frame that I use doesn't have this information that we need. So if we do it again and now run it, now we get actual SMP scores for all of these all of these words. And now to find actual keywords, um, we basically just have to sort this based on SMP. Um, so let's do this. So let's take the data frame keynotes. And in that, so we are now selecting um, certain rows here. So we are selecting from the data frame keynotes based on SMP. And so let's say we want SMP values that are larger than 1.5. We can run this, but it's still not sorted. It's already better. And now let's sort these values also um, by SMP. And we don't want ascending order. Ascending equals false. The typo in here. And now we sorted them ascendingly. And now we basically get the keywords between these two corpora. So we now know that language appears about um, three times as often in our target corpus, which is the Wikipedia articles on linguistics, than our reference. Uh, same goes for off in languages and linguistics and linguistic. Let's maybe uh, go just uh, greater than one and we get a little bit more. So we also have allow effort perhaps, but these are now at one, which is, which is really not very interesting. Um, so the interesting ones are actually um, linguistic, linguistics, language, and language, which is exactly what we wanted. And now what we could also now do since we, since we talked about it, um, as you can see, language and languages, we have both. This could be interesting, but we could, of course, also um, stem these before or lemmatize these before. Let's run it. Okay. Now let's create our SMP values for our Akinas data frame. And I have a look at that. And of course, it's not sorted yet. And now if we sort that, finally, we arrive at Languag and Linguist. And now we can see that this is combined here. And also the SMP values are a lot higher. So maybe we can now do uh, actually, um, actually this. And then we also get, for example, word or words, something we didn't get before, um, or study or linguist. And so, of course, we can do this to, for example, use the stemmed variant then to play around with that. And this is the last exercise, and this is where I want to end now after a three-hour stream. I'll cut down the recorded version of that. And I'm, again, sorry for the issue with that I didn't switch back to the code before. I hope this wasn't too bad. And I hope you have a nice evening now. Bye-bye.